computer. And that's what it said. So with any luck, we're recording. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Let's all go at it. Uh, welcome to Talking Smart Conversations with Educators and Philosophers from, from Around the World. Uh, I am your host, uh, Richard Mort Morehouse. Our guest today is Dr. Phil Kahn. Phil is an honorary associate professor at the School of Ma Humanities and Language at the University of New South Wales uh, in Sydney, Australia, where he was previously a member of the academic staff for many years. Uh, Phil has uh, a, a, D a DPhil, uh, Doctor of Philosophy, from the University of Oxford. He's an international school philosophy authority. Uh, he has run workshops for educators in many countries. And aside from his academic publishing, he has written numerous books for uh, teaching uh, children. Recently, he has returned to art, his first love, producing small, uh, producing paintings on psychological and social issues. I will post your um, publications and whatnot when we um, when we go to the uh, YouTube feed. So, sure. okay. So, uh, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, your you as an artist and what the rebirth of your artist is, artistry is all about. <laughs> well, thank you, Mort, uh, for that introduction. Yes, yeah, so all about art. Well, I, I, as a young man, when I left school, got a scholarship to go to art school, uh, much against my father's best wishes, I should add, because where's the uh, career in that? <laughs> anyway, I spent a few years when I was young, not many, as a struggling artist and uh, uh, gravitated to philosophy. <laughs> my father also thought that wasn't a very good move either. <laughs> until, of course, I uh, did very well academically and uh, had an academic career. But art, uh, yes, I, that was my first love as a child and as a young person. And unfortunately, as many people know, during a busy life and career with uh, career and family, uh, it became just a bit of a sideline. But since I've uh, retired now, I have a lot more time. And so I've returned to painting, which is the main thing that I do now. Yeah, and I, I, it's it is a great love of mine, and also I think, uh, in in a somewhat old fashioned way these days, there's a kind of humanism in what what I do. I try to look at people in their lives and in place, and to locate them, and to try to bring out something about their their life uh, in the way that I depict them, and in the sort of surrounds in which I place them, and uh, so I have a kind of deep interest in the in the you know in a in people in place and yeah. what that means yeah, yeah. Well, excellent um just for the record i will send you something there was just an article in today's atlantic um by oh. um uh i'm gonna forget its name now um oh uh, david burke david brooks you may know right. some of this stuff uh, and he has a new article about people changing careers uh, after they retired um, and mm -hmm. talking about how people often fall back to their first loves and they make a, a, a new uh, a, a new start on life. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the people called it the encore years. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and interestingly enough, I think that's kind of what I'm doing you know, I didn't make a big leap, but I'm kind of doing this with these uh, YouTube things. It's uh, hmm. not really my academic work, but it's uh, uh, a, a new way to look at things. I think from uh, for me as well. So yes, and 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 uh, just to add to that, Mort, I, I mean, I think a lot of people would say, "Oh, well, now you've got time to you know engage in your hobby." And that's not the way I look at it at all. I, I think, you know, it's a serious enterprise and then a joyful one. And it's part of the meaning of your life. It's not just, you know, something you do to fill in the time. It's something that, uh, you, you know, you, you, you strive to achieve something uh, and to understand something about people and, and, the, and the world in which you live. So I don't regard it as a hobby. I just regard it as another, another part of my life. Yes, 
Well, and I think I, I really heard the same thing uh, a couple of weeks ago from, from Gil. Um, you know, Gil, yeah. and, and he said, yeah. interestingly enough, in addition to doing his music, he also said, for the first time, I've had a chance to do philosophy. <laughs> to actually do, yes. Well, yes. not just teach philosophy and do that sort of thing, but actually to be a philosopher. Yes, and that's that's an indictment of our uh, education system and the universities. Of that, is that how he feels? Is, My goodness, it is, but it, you know, it ends up to be so demanding that you yes. don't see the nature what your discipline is about. Often, yes, yes, yes. I never felt that actually, but I can understand that in a, in I, a busy, I, I busy world of of, of of academia that you could you could uh, feel that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it was it wasn't my experience either, but I I certainly uh, recognize that as things oh, yes. going on with lots of people. So anyway, mm -hmm. now let's talk a little bit about uh, about your ongoing work, and we talked uh, somewhat earlier about the whole business about Dewey and philosophy and uh, the connection between. Philosophy of Children and John Dewey and the process or the 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 what should I say the the uh, calling uh, to actually think uh, wow. the whole process of what thinking is about and how that relates to Lippmann and you and and uh, your work with the, with children and adults. Mm -hmm. Well, as anyone who's acquainted at all with Dewey, particularly in his, his writings relating to education, would know that uh, Dewey put thinking at the heart of school education and of education generally. Uh, and I think uh, in, a, in the same sort of way, when I first met uh, Matt Lippmann and became involved with him many years ago, uh, I recognised this straight away in what Lippmann was doing. I was not so well acquainted with Dewey in those days. In fact, uh, my uh, striking up a relationship with Matt Littman and, and Anne Margaret Sharp and others uh, directed me more seriously to look at Dewey. Uh, and, and I think that Littman and Dewey and the whole philosophy uh, for children or with children uh, enterprise uh, really set, uh, uh, focuses on this idea that thinking should be at the heart of what happens in school education, learning how to think well, um, learning how to explore ideas, uh, learning to be uh, thinkingly engaged in the world. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that in so many ways, in so many of our education systems has given lip service to, uh, but not sort of fully engaged with. And so I think that's, a message that comes out of Dewey, carried forward by someone like by, by people like Matt uh, Lippmann and his colleagues, uh, and it, it's so very important it seems to me uh, that you know I turned away from what was a straight academic career, mainly in the philosophy of mind and cognitive science, to devote much of my career to working things out in this field. Uh, as I say, what it seems so important to me that it was worth kind of really giving up uh, a very promising career in one department to take up, take it up in another, which I have to say, the colleagues where I was, uh, they were a bit uncertain about it. And they thought they, not that they looked down their noses at it, but they thought it wasn't really the sort of thing, you know, that was up to the sort of standard or the, had, the, had the philosophical prestige of the work I was doing earlier. So they thought it was a terrible sacrifice. I think it was the best move in my ac academic career that I ever made. I just uh, re related closely to that. Did you uh, have your encounter with, with Matt uh, before or after you started your doctoral work at Oxford? No, no, much after. Uh, no, I was uh, brought up uh, uh, at the University of Adelaide where I did my undergraduate and master's degrees. And that was very largely at that time, uh, uh, Anglo-American 
um, uh, um, uh, 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 philosophy based on ordinary language. So it's a sort of mid-century Oxbridge uh, approach to philosophy. Uh, I mean, it has its great strengths. Uh, when I went to when I went to Oxford, I became aware uh, of of other people uh, that I met, uh, mainly Americans who passed through the place, uh, academics, and particularly in the philosophy of mind. And I became more aware of American philosophy, but not American philosophy in the narrow sense. I mean, uh, you know, James Dewey and Co. Uh, until I met uh, until I met uh, Matt Lippmann. I mean, I'd, I'd read bits of Dewey as we did, with, particularly in relation to education, but uh, it was a very uh, passing thing, you know, and and to discover Dewey, uh, you know, in mid-career really uh, was quite an eye opener to me. And and so, uh, just to be clear, what was 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 Dewey? So so you didn't really take courses on Dewey at at Oxford. No, oh, not at all. No, no, no. In fact, I, I really, I didn't take courses in, at Oxford at all because I was doing the DPhil. So, uh, I mean, you, you sat in on lectures by people uh, of note, uh, but basically it was a research degree. Yeah. yeah well, that, you know, that's a... Uh, Oxford and other European universities are set up in that... Uh, uh, well, I, there's a, there's an old story I remember hearing about uh, the guy from America going to Oxford for his doctoral work, and he sat down with his major professor, and he said, uh, the, the major professor said to him, uh, well, what are you planning on doing? And he spent a long time explaining what he was planning to do, and he finished, and then he turned to it, and he says, well, now what do I do? Well, finish it, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was very fortunate. Uh, I had John Mackey, you may know of his work, as my, my supervisor uh, in Oxford. And he was actually a very attentive uh, supervisor and a, and a very fine man. Uh, so I was fortunate in that regard, actually. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I mean, there is a certain truth to that, that you oh, can yes. the project and you you do your project. I mean, that's a yeah. you know, support, of course, from uh, valuable people. But anyway, um, so, um, uh, well, how is the, what are some of the better ways, let's put it that way, of making sure that what we do when we educate students is is that we educate them into thinking? What are What are some parameters about how we should do that? Okay. Um, well, one of the things that I, to start with, it seems to me, uh, is that if we go to the something simple in education, let's begin with that. Um, question and answer are a standard form in school education. Uh, teachers teach uh, curriculum materials, uh, they, they teach things, and then they question students to see whether students either know the answer or have developed uh, the ability to work out the answer. I mean, say, for example, by calculation. Um, that form of question and answer of teaching things and then questioning students about them uh, in the class, in tests, in the formal examinations and so forth, that form of, of thinking or questioning is a very, very different thing from students actually having questions, students raising problems, students seeing issues and being curious about them and wanting to probe and question uh, the, the, the subject matter. So one of the things I think about thinking is uh, it begins uh, with curiosity, but it's something that's where curiosity or intellectual interest is enlivened and it turns into a kind of what I call an interrogative mode, a questioning mode, uh, so that students start to ask questions and want to search out answers or want to search out solutions or want to search out possibilities uh, for themselves. And I think there's very, very little of that in education for the most part. And I think that's a kind of key thing. In addition to that, however, you, you, you can have questions and uh, you can have interests, but 
you know, you have to be able to pursue them adequately well in order to get somewhere. So one of the things you need, it seems to me, are other skills or, and abilities to be able to carry that forward. And once again, I think uh, there are areas in school education um, where the particular kinds of uh, abilities to do things are actually at the forefront. I think, for example, in well-managed math, maths education, you get that because it's procedural very largely. You learn operations, you learn to perform them proficiently. It doesn't mean that you're doing a lot of thinking, actually. It just means you're going through a mechanical routine. So that's uh, related to what I said a moment ago. But in, for the most part in school education, there's actually very little um, direct focus upon the skills and abilities that you actually need to be able to think well. There's a lot of focus on skills and abilities in school education and school documents, but, but not ones that are really related to what we would call, going back to, to, to Dewey now, inquiry, inquiry-based skills. Um, you know, the questioning, the reasoning capacities, the ability to explore and work with ideas, what I call conceptual exploration. But these things, when you look at them now, questioning, um, reasoning, conceptual exploration as a package are really the, at the, sub, at the substance of philosophy. It doesn't mean that you don't get them elsewhere, but philosophy is very, uh, is very well placed in this regard because these general purpose capacities of questioning, reasoning, and exploring ideas are at the heart of philosophy. And so philosophy is a bit natural to be able to uh, bring these things into school education and unfortunately, for the most part, philosophy is the last thing you find in school education. Uh, and so that's the challenge, to bring the goods that philosophy, more than any other discipline, has to offer into school education and uh, to fill a gaping hole that's been left there by its exclusion. And that brings up the really interesting uh, dilemma, I suppose. And, and it's, I'm looking at there's sort of a two front, uh, I don't know, field to deal with. And one is that in order to be able to ask a lot of questions, you have to know some stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I just was looking at the experience in nature, and there's a great line in the introduction that I was just struck by, uh, where Dewey says something about everything that we uh, can know new has to be based on something that we already know. Okay. Um, and there's that really interesting dynamic. And then uh, along with that, there is, how can we be philosophical within our discipline? And how much should we do philosophy on its own as another way of informing what we do on our discipline. Yes, 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 yes. And of course, you can, you can if you have time in the curriculum, do both. But let me come back to uh, knowledge. And I would add, importantly here, what I would call understanding, or what's called understanding, um, knowing and understanding. So there is a very narrow version of knowledge, which is you know, traditionally attached to school education, and that's, that's knowing this and that and the other so-called fact, a lot of information to be learned, uh, to be uh, committed to memory, uh, to be regurgitated uh, when the occasion, is called, the occasion is called for. Well, that's a very old-fashioned notion, I, I know, but I think it's still alive and well in school education. Um, well, that's, uh, that's not... Uh, knowledge or the acquisition of knowledge there is unlike the acquisition of knowledge in any live field because in any live field where scientists or researchers in any field at all historians whatever are trying to gain knowledge in their field they're not doing that of course they need to have a lot of background they they can't argue from ignorance but they are searching for knowledge they are trying to discover things. They are trying to also understand. 
They're trying to understand how the world works. They're trying to understand history. We're trying to understand ourselves through literature and other in other fields and in art, as I was saying earlier in, in your introduction. We're trying to come to some understanding of things. Now, that's not a matter of taking in a lot of information and storing it away and giving it back. It's, it's using knowledge that you have and perhaps questioning knowledge that you have. It's using understanding that you have, but questioning understandings that you have in order to try to, to really um, come to know things through exploring uh, the world. Um, now, I think we need to have at least some of that in school education. Of course, there are a lot of things to be learned that people have learned. There's, you know, you don't want to be ignorant in some field, but what you do need to do is to, as it were, build in some of the kinds of ways of thinking that actually belong to scientists, that belong to mathematicians, that belong to historians, that belong in all the different fields of endeavor, of inquiry, going back to, to Dewey again. So, to, for kids to learn to think, if I can summarize this now, in school education is to learn to think in the ways that people who are seeking knowledge think. That's, that's really what it is to think in a way. Those people can think. They have a background. They, they have assumed knowledge, which they sometimes question. They, you know, they always have a keep a sort of sceptical eye on what they think they know and understand in case maybe they don't really know <laughs> and their understanding is deficient. They're trying to improve these things. That's what, that's what I think is uh, the core of thinking as school education. Well, and, and I, I think about this, uh, and I want to ask a question about this too, but I, my um, history is my background that I come out right. of, even right. though I'm teaching psychology and philosophy, but history is really my undergraduate and and uh, master's degree um right uh and I, I always think about um we all in the united states at least uh, learned the causes of world war one and we said here's the short-term causes the immediate causes and here's the long term and then you ask people students who have learned that how does this apply to Vietnam? How does it apply right. to? And they have no idea. They, yeah. they, it's like they never heard those words even. Uh, and not that that's that what that strategy was was the best way to think about what the causes are, but certainly thinking about what a long term, um, what led up to over the long term, and what were the immediate mm. causes. Mm. Those are things that we can sort of grapple with and say, oh, compared to this, this makes sense. Uh, and, 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 and so that one bit of that, but going back to what I was asking before, should we spend more time teaching philosophy or teaching philosophy within disciplines or philosophical ways of thinking? Yes, look, I think I think there's not there's not exactly one thing to do here. Uh, one of the one of the things I think would be a mistake is to to try to find spaces for philosophy uh, in school education just as another subject that has no bearing on the way that children think, uh, how they would think in and out of school, but in school in the other subjects that they engage in. Because um, I think there's something special about philosophy, as I was saying before, it is it provides the general purpose tools for thinking that are added to and modified in various ways in different subjects. Uh, that's partly just the history of thought speaking there, <laughs> Mort, uh, isn't it, uh, as an historian? I mean, um, so, uh, so if we come to school education, these general purpose things uh, are really what philosophy can add. And you could add them as a separate subject, but then you need to have transference and carry over into other areas. Uh, the other model, as you mentioned, is to try to build the philosophical ways of thinking into the ways that various other subjects are taught. 
that's a taller ask because you're looking at the whole education system and you're trying to encourage teachers in the various subject areas to actually, uh, you know, uh, do something about that in the way that they teach. Um, I Look, I'm in favour of both of these things. There is no one way forward. I think in the end, when you look at particular educational contexts, the, the matter is more just a pragmatic decision. What are your best chances of having some impact? What, what are the best ways forward? I, I've worked with schools and teachers over many, many years. And sometimes when you go into a school, you find there are some key people. And some of them, it might be that they, they're, they're keen to, to introduce philosophy uh, in, in the school as a separate sort of se uh, session or a separate set of uh, lessons across a week or, or, or terms or whatever it is. In other occasions, you find that there's a great deal of enthusiasm across a whole range of subjects in the school, and the school wants to embed these ways of thinking in the way that it operates. Um, and you have to then begin somewhere where you think you've got the best chance of success. <laughs> mm. And, and what, what, once you get these things underway, of course, if they're successful, uh, they, they tend, say, in a, in a school, if you're working with a particular school, say, they then tend to expand through the school in all sorts of ways that you can help to shepherd. Uh, so as I say, I think there isn't just one way to do it. The best approach is to look at the ground and see, get the lie of the ground, and see what the best uh, what the best way forward would be in that context. Well, and I, I related that, I guess, another sort of impossible question is, and I'll state it in terms of my thoughts. Um, that is, if I could really do the magic wand trick and say, okay. <laughs> Um, I, I can do this. I, I have the power to do this. What, what, what I would like to do is to revamp teacher education. Uh, because, yes. because that's where we could begin yes. to develop yes. the philosophical pieces. And, and, and yes. I, I thought for a long time about how to do this, and I don't have a, a good answer because um, – there is such a structure built up within schools of education uh, about what curriculum is and and uh, and not much thought to really what thinking is, and uh, yeah. so it, it's. Well, well if I you, think that yes, yeah, my my experience of it, it is a great deal of lip service paid to thinking in education. I mean, it's been a. You know, from the critical thinking movement of many decades ago on, been a kind of hot topic in 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 the school education. But when you come to uh, schools of education or departments of education in universities, uh, I shouldn't mention my own, but it, <laughs> uh, you know, there at that place, there are a lot of educational psychologists who've got their own ideas about things and so on. And when you start looking hard at it, there isn't much to be found on the ground. Uh, if I were thinking about that for particular, you know, in my own most local context uh, from years years gone by, I would think, and I did try a bit. It pretty hard going, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, look, uh, schools of education ha in universities have lots and lots of things that they're trying to accomplish. So they are, they are busy people with their own priorities. But philosophy, in particular, if I can come to that, is a poor relation. I mean, it's often uh, as someone who spent their life in a in a philosophy department. Uh, you look across at the, at the at the education department, and to be honest, the philosophers that go over there are isolates. Uh, it's the last place you'd want to end up. I would have thought, in my experience, uh, and you kind of maybe looked down upon by some of the your colleagues over there in the and the, the the philosophy department, and you're kind of ignored by your colleagues in the education department. So you know that's been a widespread experience you know when i've made observations around the traps that's quite common and that makes it all the harder for philosophers to get into the um, school of education in the university and try to uh 
had some uh, had some sort of revolution there. I mean, that that's that's quite a fanciful notion, actually, when you look at the realities of the situation as I've seen it. Well, when I started teaching in the School of Education back in 1970, I suppose there was right. a lot of interesting ferment, uh, right. and there was stuff that uh, that. Uh, uh, a guy by the name of Ed Fenton was doing in history about how we do how we do projects in history and about how we oh. uh, are to act as a historians and how to think like a historian and Jerome Bruner and uh, his uh, all of his work on, uh, on on narrative and the nature of cognition and applications in man a course of study and all of those kinds of how you use artifacts to teach anthropology and and, and th there was i think a philosophical undertone to that but that seems to have gone away and 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 the other well you know people like uh like um uh, uh it's terrible walter cohen uh and his work with uh ferrari uh, paulo ferrer um that's another step in that direction and and but and, and you throw in Lippmann and every but it's still not very fertile ground within schools of education oh and i think i think uh, well, your experience there of earlier days is a, is a little refreshing but i think on the for the most part as i say i i regard it as uh whatever actually is sort of said by way of what I call lip service to it, it does remain fairly much marginalised in schools of education for the most part. And um, it's not to say that there haven't been efforts, uh, there have been, uh, but it's, it, I, I don't know that it's gone backward, uh, it, certainly here in Australia, but it, it's never really, um, you know, come right to the fore in, in schools of education. I mean, I, I, for example, when I first uh, became, you know, really deeply interested in John Dewey, uh, it, it was at a time when John Dewey was having something of a resurgence uh, of interest uh, in, in, in educational circles. And, um, but that's sort of come and sort of gone. <laughs> and maybe that's a bit of what you were saying, Mort, with other, in regard to other people. Not gone entirely, but, you know, yes, important yes but, but nothing very much actually happens uh so i guess we're old enough now to have seen things come and go <laughs> throughout our careers but not to lose not to lose heart i mean no, I, you know no, because no. yes because you do see a lot of uh head nodding and say well yes yes this is this is yeah. what we <laughs> ought to be doing but that really there, there's often ends up to be not much substance there and but, Mm. But you, you're, cert you're certainly right in your point about, about teacher education. Now, whether, you know, I've worked mainly in teacher education in the field, when teachers are out in the field, working with teachers in schools uh, and a little bit with education systems. Uh, but uh, in, in, in pre-service education, what, what you, you were talking about, uh, I, I mean, I think that's really is the place if only you could do it. I mean, that's where you could have a founding in influence upon the way that uh, schools operate and the way that they think about thinking. Oh. Well, I mean, I, you know, I've always been, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been involved in philosophy of children fairly extensively, I suppose, but I've never been hmm. old bore involved in it. But what I, tried to do all along was to try to say, well, what I've learned from Lippmann and Dewey and others is, can I apply this in teaching everyday psychology? And, right. and it's it's fairly, well, relatively easy to do in sort of upper division courses where you have mm -hmm. more free reign. Um, and I think two things that I related to that, and, and I think you, you, I would like your perspective on this because one of the things that I prided myself on, I guess, is that I thought my job really in teaching uh, anything at the university level was to teach students how to read. 
And I don't mean how to decode, yeah. but how to actually read and how to ask questions of the author and how yeah. to think aloud with authors and with other students. And, yeah. and, and, and to me, when you have some students that are interested in that sort of stuff, you can actually engage in those kind of discussions. Maybe not every day, but maybe once a week, every two weeks or uh, once a semester. But uh, I think those are the moments that I've always enjoyed in teaching at least. Uh, so does that, does that make sense in terms of an application of all of this? Are you watching your clock, by the way? Uh, no, I'm not watching. I'm relying entirely upon you. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, yeah, that make, that makes sense to me. I mean, you're looking for those teachable moments, but yeah. I think also the way I think about it, it's how you how you conceive of what you're doing in the classroom overall. How you know if you think of yourself as imparting knowledge. Uh, for, for example, and that's uh, not just you know uh, not knowing not just knowing that, but knowing how. And by the way, knowing how it seems to me is so important because as your students uh, were doing before, I mean, they've learnt this history, they can't apply it to anything, they can't yeah. do anything with it except maybe if they're good enough at it, repeat what they need to repeat in the examinations or when they're asked questions about it. That kind of. Um, knowing how to pass the exam, but knowing how, I mean, useful knowledge. Um, and that has to do not just with the knowledge that you've got, but also with the way in which you've acquired it. I mean, I think this is a point that Dewey makes in various places, actually. You know, the way in which knowledge is acquired, uh, the kind of thinking that went into it, the kind of approach to knowledge, uh, that knowledge acquisition process either lines that up as sort of a, a dead weight, as Dewey calls it, um, or as something which is active and, and, and usable, uh, productive. Uh, and so I think it's not, you know, we are looking for teachable moments, but we're, I, I think the core problem is how do we think about knowledge acquisition? How should we think in school education about the development of understanding? How should we think about enabling students to be able to do things, to have the know-how to be able to make their education something that just doesn't reside in the classroom and when the job's done, you shut the book. You know, uh, in other words, it's, kind of, it's education for life and for living. And that means doing. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. Well... I think I, if I have been watching my clock correctly, we're probably close to a half hour. Um, okay. So um, I think I will I will check to see if I have actually recorded this now. Well, uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, well, it says stop recording, so I guess that's a good sign. So I'm going to do that, and then we'll talk for a second afterwards.